All right, good morning. You can say good morning back. I know there's not a lot of us out here. It's good to see you all. Thanks for being with us, uh, those that are here in person, as well as those of you who are watching online uh, via Facebook, YouTube, or Twitch. We're glad that you are uh, connecting with us. Uh, be sure to be active in the chat, and if you are here in person, feel free. I know that this is different than uh, probably the way you've experienced church before, but feel free to have your phones out and be logged into uh, one of those services and engaged in the chat with your friends. Uh, we're calling it our virtual uh, lobby space, so uh, you will not offend me if you have your phone out right now doing that. Uh, I just, in fact, we encourage it as a way of making sure we're connecting with those people who uh, we do life with at City Church. I, I want to say one more thing, and this is uh, really just a, as a point of communication for everybody uh, and those of you who are watching online. Obviously, there is no uh, guilt or condemnation intended uh, when it comes to uh, whether or not you are actually showing up here in the facility or not. But uh, one of the things that uh, we're having a little bit of an issue with is uh, some people uh, registering and then not being able to make it on Sunday. And the only reason that this is an issue is because we can only take 50 uh, registrations. And so it's getting to where that registration list is filling uh, out to where there's not, none available and then people not showing up. And so if you register and something happens and you're not able to be here, if you could uh, contact us, uh, uh, info at citychurch.life, or um, they might even have a better way in the chat that they drop down right now, or message us on Facebook, let us know. I don't really know what the best process is at this moment, but let us know that you're not going to be able to make it so that we can free those spaces back up in the registry. That would be really uh, helpful for us. So. Uh, wanted to make sure that we communicate that. So that being said, we are in week four. We have just wrapped up 21 days of prayer, and uh, it has been a really great time of praying, being in the Word. I hope that you have taken time to do that. Uh, if you did not uh, get a copy of the prayer book, Abide, we do have a handful of copies left. You can see me after service. I'd be happy to get you one or email cat at citychurch.life and she can get you uh, a digital copy of it uh, in either PDF or EPUB format. Uh, in fact, uh, last week, Kat actually brought the word, and what a great job she did. Did she not do such a great job? Thank you, Kat, for doing that. And Kat wrote the, uh, uh, the prayer guide for this uh, 21 days, and uh, it was just really a, a, such a blessing to have her engaged in the process. So. Uh, as we're wrapping this up today, uh, and we're wrapping up this idea of, of, of being, uh, 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 of, of how important prayer is, what I don't want to do is somehow connect your mind to the idea that, well, I've done my little bit of prayer, and now I can just go on back into normal life. In fact, today, what I want to do is put an urgency inside of you to make prayer a part of how you do life all the time and how important prayer is. So uh, in John chapter 15, here in verse 4, it says, Abide in me and I in you, as the branch cannot bear fruit by itself unless it abides in the vine, neither can you unless you abide in me. And so this is the verse that is, is kind of where we, we birth this whole idea of being in prayer and being connected to God. And it's where we came up with this idea of, uh, of abide, right? And so each week we've pointed out to you uh, that abide uh, in, in our modern translation, in our modern dictionaries, it, it breaks down to mean to accept or act in accordance with uh, or to, to, to be unable to tolerate. And I, I want to keep pointing this out to you because I think it's, it's good for us to understand that words, their, their definitions change, sometimes drastically over time and sometimes just very, very, very little. And, and in, in this case, if you were to take either of the modern definitions of the word abide and try to reapply it back into this verse, it would not have the positive 
connecting, uplifting uh, perspective that it is intended to have. And it is intended to have this idea that as we are doing life with him, right, he is the life source for us. And so when we go into the Greek and we actually look at this, the, the word there means to remain, to stay, or to wait. And, and I think that there's even a generational shift that exists even maybe here in the room and online who would have already defined abide this way, uh, but going to the dictionary would have found that this was not the definition that it was giving. And so it is important for us to understand that uh, it is important for us to understand that he wants to be connected to us. And the way that we become uh, uh, connected with him once we are saved or the way that we activate that connection is through prayer. And in the first week, uh, I talked to you guys about the fact that we have authority and that we have the ability to change his mind, that these are important aspects of prayer, that he has given us authority in our lives and that we have the ability to sway his mind, right? His character cannot be swayed, but there are just, there's example after example after example inside of scripture where, where men and women went to the Lord in prayer and the Lord's mind changed. He, he, he relented. So, so know that your prayers, they make a difference. Your prayers are not just like, like a checkbox, right? You know, like, okay, I did my prayer thing for the, for the day. They, they are quite literally connecting to the Father and making a difference, not just in your relationship with Him, but ultimately they are having an impact on the world around you. So prayer is critical, and I think it is critical to what we are experiencing even right here in our world today. And so I've titled today's message in plain sight, and I'll explain what this means as we go. Um, uh, we, we started a series uh, several weeks ago, our previous series that we called Names of God, and then we moved straight into Abide. And, and both of these series kind of birthed or, or connected out of this idea of prayer when we look at Matthew 6 or in Luke chapter 11, uh, Jesus gives this instruction and he says, pray then like this, our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. And this birthed the names of God series because how, how, can we, how can we talk about his name and not understand his name, right? But, but I want to look at the entirety of this little prayer for just a moment. Let's go to verse 10. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. And what I want to do is I want to pause and I want to point out, and we do this from time to time, that there is, if you're on a digital copy of Scripture, there is a hyperlink right there uh, uh, in the ESV. It is a D. Uh, and if you have your paper Bible, there is probably some type of annotation that will point you to some little addendums or footnotes down at the bottom, right? So what is the footnote that we get here off of this verse? It says that, or the evil one, and some manuscripts add, for yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Now, have you ever heard that before? Have you ever heard the Lord's Prayer and then heard that statement added to the end of it, right? But if you'll notice that in the ESV and actually in most modern translations, that is not actually added into the verse. So let's look at the King James Version. And it says, and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil, for thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Now, uh, I'll be honest, when, when I was uh, a kid and was doing scripture memory work uh, through Sunday school, or I went to a, a Christian daycare, and we did some of that stuff there as well, uh, all of what I memorized in scripture as a kid, I memorized in the King James, and I find that sometimes now when I am quoting scripture, uh, I have a lot of these and thous in those uh, passages that I quote uh, and and so, so in the King James, though, this actually is present, but then when we go to the ESV, which is what we teach out of, or the NIV, or any number of modern translations, we'll find that it's not there. And I'm going to talk about this passage, but before I do, I want to talk for a moment about why it's not there and why we should 
care about whether it's there or not. So uh, when we go back and look at some of the oldest copies of Scripture that we have, and this is uh, an, an, an old copy of, uh, of the Greek, and inside of this text, we find that, that uh, those words are not present in this copy of Scripture. Now, why is it not there uh, in this copy of the Greek, and then why does it show up in the King James? Because there are two primary families of ancient texts, all right? Follow with me for just a moment. There is what is considered the Alexandrian family and the Byzantine family. And uh, the Alexandrian family is a group of texts that primarily originate from the area of Egypt, and they are considered to be older than the Byzantine uh, manuscripts, okay? And the Alexandrian manuscripts as a whole, they do not have this found in them. They do not have this, this, this uh, uh, for thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory written inside of it, but the Byzantine uh, manuscripts do. Now, the transition that we see that happens in how this ends up showing up really, or why there is a, a, a leaning into one family of text versus another, breaks itself back down to Catholicism and the Reformation. And when the Reformation began to take place in the 1500s, there was not just a desire for reform within the church, there was a lot of animosity towards Catholicism. And so any opportunity that the reformers had, uh, it, it, and, and it's difficult to say that this was out of some sense of like, uh, that, they were, that they were wrong in their uh, perspective, but, but whenever there was an opportunity to justifiably in their hearts and minds do the opposite of what the Catholics were doing, they ran to that. And this is one of the things that we saw happening in the midst of these translations. The reformers did not want to accept the same types of doctrine and teaching and therefore even translations that uh, what we find with uh, the Catholic Church is what they were teaching, right? And so in the 1500s, the Reformation happens, and then in 1611, the King James Version is released. And what we find is, is we find that there are other translations that are actively being worked on, and they are being translated out of a difference from these two different sets of manuscripts, okay? All right, so uh, you have the Alexandrian and the Byzantine, all right? Now, here's what I want to point out, is that there is over a 99% harmony between the two. So it is not like these are drastically different manuscripts that the Bible is being translated from. And this is important for you to understand because there are conspiracies that end up floating around online about the intentionality of evil people to go in and change scripture and that the reason that certain verses are missing out of certain translations is because of some uh, nefarious work of the enemy, and really what it breaks down to is that you have a group of scholars that are set to task for each of these translations, especially modern ones, and they are there to hold each other accountable, and what they are doing is they are trying to be as honest and complete as they can be, and this is why that a group of scholars, when they're translating and putting together the ESV, that they would not put for thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory. They would not put it in there because they believe that because the Alexandrian family of manuscripts is slightly older than the Byzantine, that it is perhaps more true to the original, okay? And so that is why they will lean in that direction and not have it. But in fairness, they will put these footnotes there for you so that it's not hidden as if as if to be like, woo, we just don't want you to know. They, they're they hoping that you'll connect the dots and look at it, and then if you see it in another translation, they have helped you understand why. So, so when we talk about this idea of the kingdom and the power and the glory, right, one of the things that gets asked is, well, okay, if it wasn't in Scripture, is it okay for people to even say it? Now, this is what we find in that 1% 
of differences between the two different manuscripts or families of Scripture is that the, the text that's in there is not stuff that adds or subtracts from the context of Scripture, all right? So this idea of kingdom, power, and glory is not something that was introduced, and then in the Alexandrian text, it was not there, so all of a sudden, we have no context for it. No, we actually find this as a continuous theme throughout Scripture. So it's not something that's just inside of this one manuscript. In fact, if we go to 1 Chronicles chapter 29, uh, it says, Therefore David blessed the Lord in the presence of all the assembly, and David said, Blessed are you, O Lord, the God of Israel, our Father, forever and ever. Yours, O Lord, is the greatness and the power and the glory and the victory and the majesty for all that is in the heavens and in the earth is yours. Yours is the kingdom, O Lord, and you are exalted as head above all. Both riches and honor come from you, and you rule over all. In your hand are power and might, and in your hand it is to make great and to give strength to all. Verse 13, and now we thank you, our God, and praise your glorious name. So these ideas of God's greatness and his power and his glory and his majesty and the eternity of heaven and all of its manifestations here on earth, these ideas run consistently throughout Scripture. So even when we are looking at two different texts, right, and we are seeing a 1% difference, those differences do not in some way add a new concept to Scripture. They are, they are universally adding on or, or in congruence with what already exists in Scripture. And they're also not taking anything away that isn't already communicated through Scripture. And this is one of the things, and we talked about this when we, when we, when we went through the series on the Bible, and we talked about the, uh, the authority of it and the consistency of it. This is one of the things that, that is so amazing about Scripture, is that the Old and the New Testament are so consistently translated with such, I mean, near impossible accuracy for humanity to sit in a room and to be, you know, and in some cases orally just saying it to another group of people who are memorizing it and saying it again, for it then to end up written down and be translated time and time again, and to find that there is a less than 1% difference inside of these texts is something that's really unheard of and very unique to the Word, and one of the reasons why we say that it is God's Word. So, why the debate? Why should we be aware, and why would scholars even spend their time uh, 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 clarifying these things? Well, the reason that they will debate this, and the reason that we should be aware of it, is because if we are not aware of it, and if we are not involved in the conversation, and if we are not honest with it, then the scriptures can be manipulated and ultimately be used for evil work. And we have seen that happen before. Uh, we have seen the, the scriptures be manipulated and twisted and used in ways that ultimately created harm. Uh, and, and what types of justification? I, I want to just use this one as an example, and this is probably the one that I think is most relevant to us uh, right now in the United States and uh, uh, probably closest in time frame to us, and that is something that is referred to as the Slave's Bible. Uh, the Slaves Bible is a text that was pie pieced together in England, uh, and when it was pieced together, it was pieced together because you had slaves and you had slave owners and you had missionaries, and the missionaries uh, were offering to come in and teach the slaves to read, and very intentionally, they were using the Scripture as their way of teaching them to read. And this actually is something that we have found with uh, uh, missionary work all over the world, inside and outside of slavery, using the Bible as the primary source for teaching people to read. And what was happening was that you had slaves learning to read, and they were reading about slavery and the end of slavery and the freedom that God wanted for people, and this was a problem for slave masters. And so what was, what was actually put together was a Bible that removed tremendous portions of it so that there was no uh, reflection 
uh, inside of the text or, or, or references to any type of, uh, of hope for their own lives. Uh, let me give you a perspective. When it comes to the book of Exodus, the slaves' Bible, the version that they were missionaries were allowed to use when they were uh, teaching slaves to read, removed all of the book of Exodus except for chapters 19 and 20. Now, what do we know about the book of Exodus? We know that the book of Exodus is a story about God's children being enslaved and God bringing them out of slavery. And in hopes of slaves not knowing this, right, it was removed. In fact, uh, the, there were a number of books that were, uh, had many chapters removed, but there were a number of books completely removed from it. Leviticus, Numbers, Joshua, Judges, Ruth, 2 Samuel, 2 Chronicles, Ezra, Nehemiah, Esther, Psalm, Song of Solomon, Jeremiah, Lamentations, Ezekiel, Amos, Obadiah, Jonah, Micah, Nahum, Habakkuk, Zephaniah, Haggai, Zechariah, Malachi, Mark, Colossians, 2 Thessalonians, Philemon, 2 Peter, 2 John, 3 John, Jude, and Revelation. Those were not even put into what was, uh, what, was uh, what we refer to as the slave's Bible. Now, uh, this is a, a, a uh, I guess, a recreation of it. Uh, you can pick this up uh, online. Uh, it has a forward in it by the guy that put it together. It's called Unholy, the Slave's Bible. There are only three copies of the Slaves Bible that still exist. Uh, two of them are in England, and one of them, uh, we, we, my family was able to see at the Bible Museum in Washington, D.C. I don't know if it's still being housed there. Uh, but what, what, is so, what was so gripping about seeing that for me was to understand that when we begin to remove or even add our own portions of ideas or things that we want people to understand from the scripture, right? It is no longer the same story. And this, this is true for any narrative work. I mean, you think about some of our favorite book series, and imagine if they just removed one of our favorite characters from it entirely, how drastically it would change the work itself. And as Christians, we have a responsibility, especially now seeing that history shows that this can be done and has been done, we have a responsibility to be in the conversation rationally, not filled with conspiracies in our mind, rationally making sure that the Word of God is preserved, right? That burden sets on us as Christians to be a mouthpiece when it comes to the topic. Now, we talk specifically about this idea of the kingdom and the power and the glory and it not being found in some of our texts. So why would we say that this is okay? Well, um, when, when they create the translations of the text, right, they want to look at entire manuscripts. But we have lots of partial manuscripts. In fact, this is one of the reasons why we know that the Bible, uh, some of the books you, you'll, you'll read on some websites that, oh, you know, well, this wasn't even written until 300 A.D. But now that they're beginning to find uh, uh, portions of ancient scrolls and texts that actually date back into the lifespan of the apostles, we know that these letters and these texts, especially of the New Testament, were written during that first century. They were not written 400 years later. And, and when we talk about this idea of the, the kingdom and the power and the glory, we actually can find this in a, a, a worship reference called the Didact. Uh, it's a Christian text, and it was written in the first century around the year 90 A.D. And so we have a copy of this in its entirety, and in this worship hymn, they actually sing for thine, or not thine, because that would be King James, but you know what I'm saying. They actually reference the kingdom and the power and the glory. So, so there becomes this, this, this idea that this is appropriate for us, right? But we understand that somewhere in those translations, we're not quite sure whether that phrase was in the original text or not. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. So what I want to do is, because this is something that I think if you're a Christian, you've probably heard before, I want to break down exactly what might be hidden in this phrasing, right? So let's talk about the kingdom for just a moment, okay? So prayer is inexplicably tethered to the kingdom, 
all right? We have to understand that when it comes to prayer and its effectiveness and its power, it is tied to the kingdom, right? What does the word tell us? John chapter 18, verse 36, Jesus answered, my kingdom is not of this world. If my kingdom were of this world, my servants would have been fighting that I might not be delivered over to the Jews, but my kingdom is not from the world. So what do we understand about the kingdom? We understand that the kingdom is not from here. It's not something that you and I have built and made. This church is not the kingdom. Our online platforms are not the kingdom. The kingdom is not of this world, right? And so we could not come to the kingdom, so Jesus brought it to us. We couldn't build it. We couldn't make it. We couldn't somehow teleport to it. So Jesus brought the kingdom to us. Look in Luke 11, verse 20. But if it is by the finger of God that I cast out demons, then the kingdom of God has come upon you. And so what we know is that Jesus performed miracles for three years of ministry, including casting out demons. And what he's saying here is that if you're seeing these things happen, you're seeing them happen because on a spiritual level, the kingdom of God has now come. And so the kingdom of God, that kingdom it is here now, but it is not something that you and I build or we just access because we're bored today. It is something that we become connected to, and we do this through prayer. You see, we are invited to be a part of the supernatural move of God through relationship with Him. The fruition of this relationship is the proof that the kingdom of God is here in the spiritual realm. Paul talks about this, right? He says, we wrestle not with flesh and blood, but against principalities. There are things that are happening around us that are not, that are not in the natural realm that you and I operate in. And what Jesus says is that when he came and when he paid that price, right, what he did was he reclaimed the deed. I talked about this in the first week. He came in and that thing that he had given to Adam and Eve that they subsequently gave to the enemy, Jesus came and took it back, right? And that was our access to the kingdom. And what did he do is he turned around and he gave it back to the believers. This time there was a stipulation, and the stipulation was you must confess faith, right? You must be a believer. At that point, you now have authority because you are my heirs, you are my kingdom agents, at that point, and so you represent the kingdom. You are the connecting point as a Christian. You are what tethers the natural world to the spiritual realm. You are the connecting point to the kingdom. You have access to it. And so you and I, right, we have this understanding the kingdom on some level is important to Jesus, right? Look here in Acts chapter 1. In the first book, O uh, Theophilus, I have dealt with all that Jesus began to do and teach. So he references the first book. Who, are we, who wrote Acts? Luke did. So Luke is referencing his first book, which would be the book of Luke, right? So he's writing, and most, most, most likely Theophilus is actually another physician. Remember that Luke was a physician. He was a doctor. And so he's, he, most scholars think that what he was doing was, as he was putting this together, he was trying to share the gospel, right? It ultimately was something that was beneficial for everybody. But he says, I have dealt with all that Jesus began to do and teach until the day when he was taken up, after he had given commands through the Holy Spirit to the apostles whom he had chosen. He presented himself alive to them after his suffering by many proofs, appearing to them during 40 days and speaking about the kingdom of God. Look at what it says here. He spent 40 days with them. 40 days, and what, was he, what, did, what did Luke say that they talked about? They talked about the kingdom. So the kingdom is obviously something that is really important to Jesus, and it is something that obviously it is important in his heart for us to have some perspective on the kingdom. 
Skip down to verse 6. So when they had come together, they asked him, Lord, will you at this time restore the kingdom to Israel? So for 40 days, he talks about the kingdom, and they come to this place where they say what? Are you about to restore the kingdom to Israel? This is the same, the same issue that they had when they were sharing that final meal with Jesus, right? And, and Jesus is sitting here talking about something bigger. There's a sacrifice that's about to take place. And they're like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, when are you going to be king, right? When, when are you going to start ruling? When, are, can, we be, can I sit at your right hand? Who's going to be your general? Like, where's the army coming from? I haven't seen them yet. And Jesus is he's sitting here going, no, 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 you don't understand what's going on. The, this kingdom is not an earthly kingdom. And so for 40 days, Jesus talks about the kingdom, and they follow up with the exact same question that they had consistently been asking, and that is, is it going to happen? At this time, right here, right now. Why? Because they wanted the kingdom to come because it benefited them. They saw immediate benefit, gratification, roles uh, uh, of leadership happening. If the kingdom was established right now, they would find their own greatness and their own authority right there in the moment. And Jesus is trying to connect them to something else. Can Can I tell you? This is really good. I hope, I hope that you get this for just a moment if you're a believer in the room, all right? This is the good news, is you don't have to get it all right today to have Jesus continue to pour into you. Jesus will continue and continue and continue to pour into you to help you all of a sudden have that aha moment, which they will have, right, where you begin to get a, a grasp on exactly what God is doing, Right? And and there's a great picture of this when we talk about our children. Hopefully you parent this way, that when you say something to your child and they're seven years old and they don't get it and they don't understand and they don't act right, that you don't just kick them out on the street, right? Well, listen, I told you that if you didn't keep your room clean, you were done. You get out there and you're living on the street, right? I'm not saying people don't do that, but that's, that's that's not how you raise a child, right? Right? So... There can be discipline, but there is what? There is a reaffirming. Hey, what did I tell you? I told you you had to clean your room. There was going to be consequences. So what do we do a week later? We come in and we do the same thing, the same exercise. We have it over and over and over and over, right, until our children begin to get it, right? They begin, oh, okay, I just need to keep my room clean so that there aren't bugs crawling all over me, right? Okay, sometimes that happens after a bug crawls over them. Then they're like, Oh, this is why you keep saying clean the room, right? So, so, so we make that investment as parents. We've experienced that in our lives, right? This, this is the same thing. Like Jesus is sitting here, and he's talking about the kingdom, and he's talking about the kingdom, and they're asking the same questions over and over and over. But what they're just not getting is that the kingdom of God is not about them. The kingdom of God is not about them. Look here in verse 7. He said to them, It is not for you to know times or seasons that the Father has fixed by his own authority. They say, Is it happening right now? And he, he says, no, you, 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 you need to hear this. It is not for you to know these things. That's not what the, your portion of the kingdom, right? Your understanding of the kingdom is not connected with what the Father is doing and when he is doing, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the end of the earth. So, sometimes it's just not about us, right? I don't know if you have kids, and if you have multiple kids, you probably have experienced this like uh, birthday craze that kids can have when it's one kid's birthday and the other kids are wanting to know why they're not getting gifts and why they're not getting cake and they don't like for it to be all about the other one when it's not about them. But when it's their birthday, they 
highly expect that it is all about them. And, and I, I don't know if you've ever had that experience before, but, but, but hypothetically, I might have kids that operate like this when it has been one child's birthday that the other one has been saying, oh, this isn't fair. But when it's their birthday, I don't have to correct any of the other kids because they will do all the correcting for me. It is my birthday. You will keep your mouth shut. Don't you touch my presents while I'm opening them. You look me in the eyes while I'm talking to you. I'm telling you this is my day, right? Okay, so there are just times where it's just not about us. And it's not just on birthdays. There are so many seasons of life where it is just about other people. One of, one of my favorites to remind people of is at a wedding, right? And, and I feel like that at a wedding, if there is a uh, wedding planner, it is their responsibility to remind everybody that it is the bride's day and nobody else's day. Now, if there's not a wedding planner uh, and I'm officiating the wedding, I feel that it falls to me to be the reminder. And I'm probably not as kind as a wedding planner might be, although I have seen some wedding planners that scare me. I'm not going to lie. Uh, I stayed out of their way, you know. But, but I, will, I will at the rehearsal say one of the last things that I'll do at the end of the rehearsal, on, 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 typically on Friday night, is I'll say, hey, listen, Tomorrow, when we do this whole thing, I just want to remind everybody in here, except for the bride, that it is not about you. And so if you have some problem, some issue, you don't like the way something has turned out or the look somebody gave you, and I'll try to make direct eye contact with mamas because this is hard for mamas to hear, right? Uh, Do not go into the bride's room where she is preparing her heart for the day she has waited for her entire life before she even knew she was waiting for it, right? She has been waiting for it. Do not go in there and unload on them about everything that's wrong because you will infect their day. And then I will look at the groom and I will say that tomorrow is not your day. Tomorrow night is your night. Tomorrow That's her day, right? Okay? You have waited for tomorrow night your whole life, so be quiet and follow around and do what you're told to do, and then you will have whatever fun you're looking for, hopefully, that night. You know what I'm talking about. Because it's just not your day. Funerals are the same way. Somebody passes away. Can I tell you, that is not the day for me to get up there and deliver an hour-long sermon to the people who are mourning right? That is, it is, it is not my day, okay? It is not the day of some friend that you haven't seen in a year to all of a sudden be the person who is, who is talking really loud in the room and taking all the attention. It is the day for the family, for them to mourn and for them to bury this person whom they loved, right? And to deal with grappling with all the the, the questions of why did it happen this way and why did it happen now and and, and, and what is this going to mean for children or grandchildren or or spouses. And and, and it is just, sometimes it's just not about you. And I'm not saying this because I, I think that I expect that we always get this. In fact, I think it's the opposite. I think we just have to constantly be reminded that it's not about us. And, and the disciples, they were no different, right? They, they, want, they saw the kingdom of God. They saw Jesus as king as being awesome, and it is awesome. But he keeps telling them, it's just, this is just not about you. Because the kingdom is the king's domain. It is about the king. It is about the Father. It is about His dominion. And it's a perspective that you and I need to get. Now, let's talk about the power for just a moment. I don't know if you caught this, but when they were talking about the kingdom, right, there, and they were asking, is this going to happen? Jesus was telling them it wasn't about them, but He told them what was for them. What did He say there? He says, but you will receive power. See, the power is what is for us, right? Through what? When the Holy Spirit has come upon you. So the Holy Spirit of God dwelling in us, through us, right? That is is for us. And so when it comes to the kingdom, the king's domain, his rule, his majesty, what we get to be a part of is we get to be a part of having the Holy Spirit in our lives. And so his power extended or imparted to us 
that power that belongs to him, that is a overflow of his kingdom, he says, I'm giving this to you. I'm imparting this in your life. So let's look at a few verses real quick. Mark 14, verse 48. And Jesus said to them, have you come out as against a robber with swords and clubs to capture me? So we're right here at this point where Jesus is about to be taken and he's going to be crucified. Day after day, I was with you in the temple teaching and you did not seize me, but let the scriptures be fulfilled. Verse 50, and they all left him and fled. Who left him? All. So these people who believed that he was going to be the king of this awesome kingdom, They saw some other soldiers show up. They saw him about to be taken into custody, and they all ran away. We get into Acts, right? And there's there's no soldiers around, and so what do they do? For 40 days they sit there and listen to him teach because they still want to be at his right hand. They still want this earthly kingdom. And Jesus knows that they need something in them, or what are they going to do? You see, without power, you're going to continue to flee. I heard an interesting commentary on the following verse here. And a young man followed him with nothing but a linen cloth about his body, and they seized him. But he left the linen cloth and ran away naked. Now, why would this be right here sandwiched in with these verses, right? So Jesus is going to pray, and there is one guy. Now, who's with him? They're in the upper room. They're having a meal. Jesus says, I'm going to pray. Some of them go with him, right? Okay? So most likely, this is one of the disciples that has followed Jesus out here to pray, and the guy is wearing nothing but a linen cloth, And when they show up, he is so afraid, he leaves the linen cloth and just runs off, right? Streaking through uh, the the streets of Jerusalem uh, in in panic. And and what was interesting is is that that when you read through some of the the Gospels, John will use language where he will talk about a certain man, and he'll be talking about himself, right? And, and it's just this tool that they use in a moment where they aren't necessarily trying to name themselves, but, you know, through the prompting of the Holy Spirit, they need to communicate something. And so one, commentary, one commentator said that this was possibly Mark and that he's sitting here writing and the Holy Spirit is saying, all right, now tell them what you did, right, when, when they showed up, right? You talk about everybody fleeing, but tell them what you did. And so a certain man dropped his clothes and ran off nude through the streets, right? The only way that you do that is if you don't feel like you have any authority in the situation. When you feel like you don't have authority, when you feel like you don't have power, when you feel like you don't have any say, you do what? You flee. You run. And you see, they were filled with fear until they were filled with something else. And I want to tell you, in your life, you will be the same way. You will be filled with fear until you are filled with fear something else. Go to Acts chapter 4, verse 31. And when they had prayed, the place in which they were gathered together was shaken, and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and continued to speak the Word of God with boldness. With boldness. You see, the the, the power that came to them from the Holy Spirit was something that was injected into their lives. That boldness came when the Holy Spirit came on them. And and I I want to point something out here. Uh, It says that they, the scripture says right here that they prayed, right? So in chapter 2, they were baptized with the Holy Spirit one time, but they were regularly filled with the Holy Spirit. And how was that? It says that when they had prayed, right? So you might have become a believer and been filled with the Holy Spirit and had an an amazing encounter with God where you felt like you could do all things. And then today you're thinking to yourself like, man, I don't even know if I can get out of bed and go to church. And I want to tell you that 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 weakness that you begin to experience as a Christian is a result of the Holy Spirit not being refilled inside of you, and that is resolved through prayer. 
if you are not regularly praying, if you are not consistently coming to the Lord in prayer, you will consistently feel like you are disconnected from that boldness that is needed to change the world. And you won't feel like you can share the gospel, and you won't feel like you can lead a friend to, to, to Jesus. You'll make all the excuses that you need to to run away there, even if it embarrasses you. You, you would rather drop your clothes and run off in the nude than to stand there with boldness. And the reason is because you are filled with fear and not with the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit will give you boldness. And what I'm saying to you is you have got to be praying. You have got to be somebody who is making prayer a part of your daily routine, your daily life. How were they filled? They were filled because they prayed. And you and I have got to understand the importance of prayer. If you don't get anything else out of this series, please get it in your heart that prayer as a believer is critical, and we need it now. The world needs believers who are not weak and infinite, but instead are filled with boldness. And the only way that that's going to happen is if the Holy Spirit is in us, if we are taking our knees to the Lord in prayer. And then the glory, the glory. Look in 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 7. The end of all things is at hand. You ever feel like that right there is talking about today, right? It's, it's, it's interesting how timeless the scriptures are, right? How many seasons there have been where it feels like that the world is falling apart around us, that the end of all things is at hand. And this is, this is what he goes on to say, therefore be self-controlled. When you feel like things are falling apart, that's the time for self-control and sober-minded for the sake of what? Your prayers. When the chaos of the world ensues, you need to have self-control and be sober-minded so that your prayers benefit from that. Above all, keep loving one another earnestly, since love covers a multitude of sins. Show hospitality to one another without grumbling, as each has received a gift, use it to serve one another as good stewards of God's varied grace. Whoever speaks as one who speaks oracles of God, whoever serves as one who serves by the strength that God supplies, in order that in everything God may be glorified through Jesus Christ, to him belong glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. Who receives the glory? the Father receives the glory. We receive the power, God receives the glory. You see, the effectiveness, the effectiveness of your prayers is directly connected to God receiving glory. You want to be filled with the Holy Spirit, you want to have boldness, but in your prayers, your prayers have got to be as such that you are glorifying God. That you are giving glory to where it is due. Can I tell you that this is problematic? And this can be problematic in the church. And it can be problematic in leadership. And even in, in the time of the New Testament authors, these apostles that are living their lives, there are ministers of the word that have risen up and they seek to glorify themselves. And it is not about me, it is about him. God be glorified. So how do we give him glory? How do you give him glory? Peter laid it out for us very simply. He said, you love one another. There's no ifs, ands, or buts, no pauses, no conditions in there. You love one another, you show hospitality, and you serve one another. You want to glorify God in your life? He says, you start right here. Glorifying God. Why? Because we glorify him through the way we live our lives. Because this is what happens. People will look at us and say, I want what you have. 
I want what you have. But people have to see something that's different than what they have. And this, this is not normal. This is not the first thought that comes to our mind when things go wrong. This is not the first thing that comes to my mind when I get cut off when I'm driving. I'm not talking about you, I'm talking about me. Maybe I am talking about you. This is not the first thing that comes to my mind when I get the wrong package in the mail or it's a day later than it was supposed to be and I've got to call customer service. This is not the first thing that comes to mind when I'm done grievously wrong. But this is where God's glorified. And nobody said that glorifying God was something that was simple and easy, but it's necessary. I would say notice what it's not. It's not wrath on your neighbor. It's not hate. It's not lives filled with anger. And it's certainly not using Scripture to manipulate others. You see, we have a consistent call on our lives to be the ones that love the people around us. So I'm going to wrap up here. Why talk about this phrase, for yours is the kingdom, the power, and the glory? We'll go back over here to Matthew chapter 6. But right before he gives this this, uh, prayer that we've been talking about, this is what he says. He says, and when you pray, do not heap up empty phrases as the Gentiles do, for they think that they will be heard for their many words. Jesus says this. He gives this caution. And he says, when you pray, do not just heap up these words. Don't just take this phrase and make this your prayer. Don't just go and say something, right? It's like, oh, I've got to say prayer. We'll just say the Lord's Prayer and be done with it, right? He wants to make sure. He he says what? He says that these become empty phrases. And so the reason that I wanted to dive into a portion of scripture that might not show up in every translation is because your prayers should be out of your understanding of the word. There's a formula, but they should be your prayers. And so if you recognize that the kingdom of God is his and the power is his and the glory is his, then communicate with him in such a manner. Because your prayer matters. It makes a difference. It's got to be your prayer, though. Listen, there are prayers that we use all the time. We use the same ones with our kids when we're giving thanks over a meal. So we do the same thing. Like, I'm not trying to down, you know, the, uh, the, the heritage of certain prayers. Some of them are beautiful. Some of them have tremendous meaning. What I'm saying is if that's the only time you're praying is reciting someone else's words, then you actually aren't praying. See, we compare those beautiful moments in history into our lives, but we also have the responsibility to create the words out of our own heart, our own existence, and to be able to communicate truth and talk to the Father. And and when we do, right, when we do this, then we are the ones who receive from God, the boldness that we need to do the work to bring him glory. So, in this text with Peter, what does he say here? He says, as one who serves by the strength that God supplies, right? What's that strength? What is it that God supplies? It's that power. It's the Holy Spirit. God supplies that And he goes here and he says, to him belong glory, right, and dominion, kingdom, the king's dominion. It is his dominion, right? What does it say here? To him belongs the glory and the the dominion, but to us 
right? We, he supplies us with the strength, the power. It's all his, right? But he's, he's extending this strength to us. But the glory and the dominion, they're exclusively his. We don't get any access into those. The kingdom, that's what is coming. The power, that's what he gives. And glory is what we give. There's a consuming upward and downward action that is taking place around us. And when we are in prayer, we are literally connected into the current that is bringing it all together. And we do not have to sit there and say, I just wish Jesus would come back for us to see Jesus move in our midst. We can instead start focusing our lives on being connected to the Holy Spirit. And Jesus can do the work right here, right now, in our homes, in our neighborhoods, our communities, our nation. I want to ask you to stand to your feet as we close this morning. If you're at home, I ask you every week just to take a moment. If you would, just pause what you're doing. I know that it's tempting. We do the same thing when we're at home watching things online. We'll be getting ahead of some chores, working in the kitchen or, or, or whatever. But if you could just pause for a moment. If we could as a church community, as a family, whether we are here or at home, just pause our hearts for a moment and connect to the Father. I want to give you an opportunity here to respond to the word. And we respond to the word by acknowledging our own need. And so if you're if you're hearing this right now today and you would say I I I need to make a commitment to be somebody who is more consistently standing in prayer, then today I want to pray with you with heads bowed and eyes closed for just a moment. We want to go to the Father. And I want to give you an opportunity to, with your own words to connect with Him. So just in your heart right now, just begin to speak. The formula is there. Just give him glory. Tell him that you love him. Present whatever need that you're facing right now. Maybe it's a need for healing in a family member, a financial need. Maybe it's an, a, a relationship, emotional. The example that Jesus used was to not be led into temptation. But Lord, we come right now and we thank you. You are you are worthy, you are holy. You are beautiful. Lord, I pray for, personally, I pray for, for, for the people that call City Church home right now, that they would be refreshed in their spirits, that they would be encouraged in their hearts, that they would, that they would be right now just connecting to this need to be in prayer more than, the, than a need to be connected to anything else in the world right now. A need to be connected in prayer to you. That, Lord, you would fill them with your Holy Spirit. There would be a, a, re, a revitalized and renewed boldness for the kingdom of heaven. For you are worthy and you are holy. With our heads bowed and our eyes closed, I also want to take a moment and pray for those that want to know this Jesus. They want to make this decision, that the most important decision that they'll ever make, and that is to make Jesus Lord of their life. To gain access into this, 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 uh, this eternity that the Word talks about. And for those that are making that decision right now, the scripture says that if we believe in our heart and confess with our mouths that Jesus is Lord, we will be saved. And it's a really simple thing. We just pray and we just say, Lord, I'm a sinner and I need you in my life. I need a Savior. Help me to know you 
Reveal yourself to me in new ways. I make you Lord of my life today. Lord, we ask all these things in your mighty name. Amen and amen. Guys, we love you. Our prayers are with you. Please be in prayer. Next week, we're going to jump into a series uh, on the life of Daniel. It's going to be really awesome. I hope you'll make plans to be a part of it. We have midweek on Wednesdays online. You can connect on Facebook, YouTube, Twitch uh, at 7 o'clock. It's a 30-minute Bible study. We'd love to see you connecting on there. Uh, otherwise, we will see you next Sunday. Go change your world. We love you guys. Thanks for streaming with us.